All right, let's take our Bibles this morning and open up to a very familiar passage of Scripture. John chapter number 14. John chapter number 14. You know, there's information everywhere right now on what we're going through, but who do you trust? You know, the further we go along through things, the more information you get. But we get into a situation oftentimes where we have to make absolute judgments on inabsolute, if that's a word, inaccurate or limited information. And that's a hard place to be in. And I want to preach a little bit about this morning from John chapter number 14 because it's amazing to me how the Lord sometimes gives us information or allows us to have certain things and then sometimes he doesn't. I mean, think about all the years where if somebody got really, really bad sick, the best medical advice they could give you was, let a surgeon come and cut your wrist and drain your blood out. I mean, that was the doctors and the smartest men of the world all the way up into, you know, obviously the revolutionary days. I mean, for thousands and thousands of years, certain things men did not know and God did not feel obligated to let him know those things. And, and sometimes this stuff baffles me, but as we shared in our testimony, we are to live by faith and we have to go on what God gives us. And so as we look in this passage in John chapter number 14, I want to bring out a phrase here that I think will help us and encourage us this morning. Verse number 1, the whole passage is encouraging, but look in verse number 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. The phrase I want to pull out in verse number 2, if it were not so, I would have told you. God has told us what we need, and let's just go on that. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for an opportunity to assemble. Lord, it's a blessing to be with my brothers and sisters. It encourages me. Lord, I need Christian fellowship. And Lord, I need to hear the prayers and the praises of your people. And Lord, it's good for us, and we thank you. And God, as we turn to your word, we pray the power in this book would get inside of us, that it might help us, that it might encourage us. Lord, we pray that your spirit would move in us and you might give us what we need to move forward in our Christian life for this week. Lord, you've got a path and a plan for us. Lord, help us the beginning of this week as we assemble to get ready for what you may have for us this week. We pray you bless the message, use it to help us. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. I think sometimes we've bought into this quest for knowledge type of deal. I know I have. And the danger in that is you think that just because you have easy access to information that that makes you something more than you are. And really the Bible says every man in his best state is altogether vanity. And so we've all bought into this quest for having more and more information. And oftentimes even biblical information, if it doesn't draw you closer to Jesus Christ, what's the use in it? Just so you can walk around and say you know the Bible better than somebody else? I mean, I'm not trying to brag or boast or anything, but I'm not embarrassed to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any theologian or anybody that I come across or read because I know what the Scripture says. But what's, what good is that? If it doesn't take me to a closer relationship to Jesus Christ and I can't serve and find my purpose in serving Him better, what good is it? What good is the information? The Bible talks about folks that are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. There are things, probably some of the things we're going through right now, to where we may never get to the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of what's behind all of this. So what do we do? Well, we go with what information we have. We try to make personal decisions and discernment best as we can. And I want us as Christians to try to turn our attention to our spiritual lives. Because you and the Lord, that's the most important relationship right now. Amen. And so it sounds so simple and so ignorant to say, all you need to know is right here. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, all you need is right here. Amen. Well, I need my news updates. I need my phone updates. I need my... You need this right here. That's all you need. Now here in this great passage, he addresses 
trouble in life. And I think we're having a little bit of trouble. We still have first world problems. I mean, all the, all the shelves aren't empty in the grocery store. Amen. Now, they may get to where they're all empty in the grocery stores. But so far, so good. We are still abundantly blessed as far as prosperity goes. And we are experiencing some trouble. But you'll notice in verse number 1, he addresses trouble and the uncertainty that they're getting ready to face as he is getting ready to leave. And he says, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And he says, if it were not so, I would have told you. So I want to kind of tune in on that little phrase, if it were not so. The first thing I want you to see in verse number 1, if, if he would have told us if we should be worried. He would have told us if we should be concerned. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Now, I can take this passage, and I think we can just swipe it all the way across the church age. Because as a believer in Jesus Christ, we already have our mansion in the sky reserved. We already have our ticket paid by the blood of the Lamb. We already have our name in the book of life. We already have the Holy Spirit as a down payment. I mean, we've got what we need, so why should we be troubled? Why should we be worried? If we should be worried, he would have told us. He said, if it were not so, I would have told you. Can you trust everybody you meet? <laughs> Can you trust the news media? Can you trust all of your government officials? Can you trust all of your religious leaders? <laughs> Can you trust even all the people you work with? And so we think about this and we say, well, how can I put my faith in people? But that's not the question. The question is, you believe in God, believe also in me. The thing is contrasted. Trouble is contrasted with belief and with trust, and the trust is in God. We obviously have a crisis of worry. Psalm 38, 6, he says, I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. Trouble is more than just, oh, you had a flat tire on your car. Trouble is... This, this cloud that comes and this worry and this concern and this turmoil that comes. Jesus says, I would have told you if you needed to be bent out of shape. You know, if it's time to worry, start worrying. <laughs> but when it's not time to worry, don't worry about it. What does Paul say? Be careful for nothing. Now, if you know your Bible, you know a couple things about this. I'm just remind, remind you of them. In uh, Matthew chapter 13, when he tells the parable of the sower, he talks about the sower goes out and sows these seeds. He puts a seed down here, it does this, a seed down here, it does that, a seed down there, four different ones. One of them, the seed springs up, it, it rises up, just like uh, some of you got your crops coming up now and so forth, and you see, like Brother Franklin calls it, the Jesus rain. Boy, we had some good Jesus rain the past few days. You can water and water and water, man, but when the Lord sends the rain, there's something in that rain that does miracles of those crops, and especially that grass. Man, the grass needs cutting now. It's that high. And so you, you see that thing spring up, but the Bible says in that parable that one of them springs up, and then it gets choked out with all the weeds. Well, when he goes to interpret the parable, he says, it's the cares of this life that choke out. The, the fruit. The cares, being full of care, concern, being troubled, it'll choke you out. You can get yourself up and work yourself up in a frenzy. You can feed your mind all of these things. You can, you can uh, uh, stir yourself up and get worried about whatever. It could be an exam you're getting ready to take, young people. It could be a, uh, a situation at work that you're having to deal with. Who likes to deal with conflict, especially with people underneath you or employers or employees or, or customers? Who likes to deal with that? And you can think about it and worry about it. It can be something concerning your health. And the doctor says, come in, we need to talk. And he calls you on Friday. <laughs> and you've got to wait the whole weekend. Yeah, I appreciate that, Doc. Or he doesn't even call. The secretary calls. Or some automated message calls. You need to be on the appointment to see the robot. Aren't you tired of talking to robots? So what do you do? You just, never mind. I will say you get your gun out and shoot the robot. But this concern, this care chokes out the word. Another example I want to remind you of is Martha and Mary. Remember how that Mary said at Jesus' feet? He told Martha, he said, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled. 
See how those words connect? Careful and troubled about many things. You think about a still pond where the, it's, just, it's just like glass. You can skip those rocks on top of it. It's just calm. It's still. But you think about it when it's troubled. The wind's blowing a lot and that thing's troubled up. It's almost like you're out on the, on the gulf because it's got, like it's got waves coming in because of all the water being troubled. Jesus would have told us if we should be worried. What's the cure? Verse number one. Believe. Faith. Jesus Christ and God can balance out your life. And what we need in times of crisis is balance. Don't be stupid. When somebody sneezes, don't run up in front of them and say, Hey, don't be crazy. Let's be balanced. Notice verse number 27. If you come on through the rest of the chapter, he mentions this again. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Notice the contrast between what the world tries to give us and what Jesus gives. The world always counterfeits God. The world will give you something to temporarily relieve your stress. The world will give you something to temporarily give you a sense of security. The Lord will give you absolute security and absolute peace. So don't be afraid. No reason to fear. Uh, you ever see those guineas? Um, you know, them, they're, they're, some people like them because they say they're, they're, they, they warn you of people coming because they go crazy and they, they bark like a dog almost, I guess. They'll let you know when stuff's coming. But them things can fly. They can do like a helicopter and go straight up in the air. And if something's coming after them, they can just go straight up in the air. But what will happen oftentimes, they'll get just in a frenzy and just go back and forth. And some people, that's what they do when they can just go straight to the Lord and take care of the situation. Instead, they just go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and worry and worry and worry and mull it over and mull it over. I call it rehashing. Just rehash it, rehash it, rehash it. The, the stuff's old. Just throw it out. Let not your heart be troubled. Jesus would have told us if we should be worried. Now, I'm not talking about being precautious. I'm not talking about taking, uh, having some common sense. I'm talking about this spirit of panic and fear. The worst thing that can happen for us can be the best thing. So what's the worst thing? Well, you could, uh, you could go out and lightning bolt could hit you and you could die. You could trip and fall and die. You could die tonight. You could get sick and die. But if you're saved, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Do we really believe that? He would have told us if we should be worried. Verse number 2. He also would have told us if he didn't have enough room for us. <laughs> Verse number 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. People say, well, you know, the King James Bible's wrong because this is the only Bible that uses the word mansion. Well, don't pull the mansion out of my Bible. Amen. There's nothing wrong with using and translating that word mansion in your King James Bible. And there's no need to apologize. You say, well, I just don't understand in my father's house or mansions. That's like saying in the city is a county or in the, in the city is a state. No, you don't realize the father's house is New Jerusalem. That thing is over 1,500 square miles. You read about it over there in the book of Revelation, depending on how long a furlong is. When you read the dimensions in Revelation chapter 21, that's a big house. In his house are many mansions. There's plenty of room. And the Lord would have told us. I like that song we sing sometimes at invitation. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room. There's always room. There's always room for a sinner to get saved and come home. He would have told us if there wasn't enough room. He would have told us if he just picked so many to go to heaven and so many, else, so many others were going to go to hell. He would have told us that. But no, he says, there's plenty of room. Why don't you come? I'm glad there's a place prepared for me. Uh, there was this uh, very rich lady, and uh, she dreamed a dream that she died and went to heaven. And this is back in the day when everybody had real rich people had servants and all this kind of stuff. Well, she uh, went to heaven and the angel's taking her around. She's going through the streets of gold and seeing all these mansions and stuff. And lo and behold, she sees a mansion and it's her servant's mansion. It's a big old place. And she's getting really, really excited. She's like, wow, you know, that's my servant's. And I can't imagine what I'm going to have. 
So then the angel keeps taking her along the street, and you know, they make a few more corners, and they go down this little back alley, and they find this little gold shack. It's a gold shack. <laughs> and now it's her. She's like, what? My servant's got a big mansion. Look what I have. And the angel said, this is all we could build with what you sent up. The Bible says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust doth not corrupt, where thieves don't enter in and steal. In other words, the things you do down here build your mansion up there. And that's the idea. There's enough room. I'm not worried about running out of room. I'm not worried about social distancing in heaven, amen. We'll have plenty of room up there, thank the Lord. Notice verses 2 and 3. He would have told us if he didn't have to go. Now, this is always put a question in my mind. I always wonder this, and maybe you do as well. Jesus rises from the dead, and then he's on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. 40 days and 40 nights, he's on the earth, and he communes with his disciples. He talks with them. He fellowships. He makes all those appearances. We read about the different appearances that he makes with them and some of the things he tells them. He gives them the great commission and so forth. That always puzzles me. And it's interesting as you study that to think about Jesus and being with his disciples after he rose from the dead. I imagine Peter starts getting these ideas again. He's thinking, okay, we didn't get to do it the first time, you know, when the saints go marching in. We didn't get to bring in the kingdom the first time. What about now, Lord? Acts chapter number 1, they're gathered around before he leaves and they say, are you getting ready to restore the kingdom to Israel? Remember, the theme of your Bible is about who's the king of the hill. That's the theme of the Bible. Who's on top? It starts out God, and then here comes the devil, and then you got this situation with Adam, and then you got this situation with the devil again, and then Jesus Christ comes, and you have this struggle with the kingdom, and God has made a promise to put Israel on top, and Peter's like, are you going to restore the kingdom now? And Jesus says, not now. We're not going to deal with the kingdom of heaven now. We're going to deal with the kingdom of God. There's a spiritual kingdom. And he would have told us, if he didn't have to go, but he had to go. And he left, and he told those disciples, I'm going to give you some signs to do, and greater, great, you're going to do greater signs than I did, and you're going to bear witness of me. And they do. You read the Acts of the Apostles. And he leaves, and he goes, and they didn't get to bring back the kingdom. And the Jews, you know the story in the book of Acts. They say no over and over. And we know what happens. We know there's a postponement of that kingdom for the nation of Israel until his second coming. But he left. Now, I'm, I'm kind of partial. I'm kind of glad he left. Although I'm perplexed about it, I'm partial to it because I was able to be born. <laughs> Aren't you glad that you were created? God made you. He created you. He gave you life. And if you're saved, he gave you everlasting life. I'm glad he made me. I'm a conscious soul. And if he would have consummated the kingdom, if the church age would not have happened, we wouldn't even be here. You know, I'm glad. I'm partial to the fact that Israel rejected Jesus Christ because us Gentile dogs got a chance. Amen. Through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles, even if it is just to provoke them to jealousy. Maybe we'll provoke them. I don't know. But he had to go prepare a place for us. Now, I read about the creation. The Bible talks about all things were created by the breath of his mouth. And we know that in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. We know in verse 14 of John chapter number 1, the Bible says the Word was made flesh. So the Word of God is Jesus Christ. When you read creation's story in Genesis 1, you see all three of the Trinity. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was out form of order, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said. There's the Word of God, Jesus Christ. So you have all three. So you think about Jesus Christ speaking the world into existence and speaking the stars into existence. All these things made by the breath of His mouth. Here He says, I'm going to go, and we don't know how long of a time, but at, at least now it's been 2,000 years He's been working on this thing. Now, if he just created everything in the breath of his mouth, and you've seen the cosmos, if you've looked at that, of course, we're looking at probably a, uh, a ruined state. You think about how large and how big, I mean, four point something years for light. I forget what a light year is, four point something years. 
But you think about how vast the universe is and the galaxies and all this stuff and then everything's dead out there, what it might have been prior to all of that, just with the creation of his mouth. You think about all the host of heaven with all the angels and the cherubim and the seraphim that you read about. And here he's been working on this thing, and as far as our time goes, for 2,000 years? Boy, what a mansion. Revelation chapter 21 describes that place. He's gone to prepare a place for us. And for those who are not saved, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 20, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the heaven and earth fled away, and there was found no place for them. People that aren't saved, you ever go to a funeral and you try to say the right thing, and don't get mad at people when they say things because they're just, in their, in their human way, they're trying to say the best thing they can to console you. You know, and sometimes they say stupid things. You know, they're laying there and they look awful and they say, don't they look good? And you're thinking, they look dead. You know, but people just try to say things that they mean well. Don't get mad at them. And they oftentimes, people say, one of the sentiments that actually comes from John 14 is he or she, if they've passed on, they're saved. They say he's in a better place. And that's true. Amen. If they're saved, they are in a better place. Miss Sue is in a better place. Way better than us. And so that phrase has been, you know, people have picked up on that, and that's a good thing. A lot of things from the Bible, even, even people that don't know the Lord pick up on these things. But that is a phrase that comes from this passage, and then when you compare it to Revelation, you realize somebody that's not saved, they're not in a better place. They're in a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. They go from sickness to hell. If they're sick... Or if they go through pain, can you imagine living your whole life and suffering and having an awful existence on this life and then dying without Jesus and going to hell? That's a tragedy. That's a, you talk about a missionary call. Man, you go to some of these places, some of these countries, AIDS is just, you know, 90-something percent. And you have some of these countries where people lived only be in their 30s and 40s, the, the populations of some of these areas, because everybody's infected. And some of them have to live most of their life. They might get one good meal a week. And then they die without Jesus Christ and go to hell. What, a, what an awful existence. There's not a good place for them. You ever hear people say that phrase when somebody's having a psychological breakdown or they're going through all, some awful time? They're not in a good place right now. Well, you might not be in a good place right now, but you're going to a good place. Amen? He's got a place prepared for us. And I think about this preparation, man. I, I tell you what, it excites me, it encourages me that the Lord is, is building a place and it's personalized. He's got a mansion for me and that Bible talks about our house that we're going to be clothed with upon from heaven over there in 2 Corinthians 5. And so we have a place. Yeah, we're sending up some of the materials, but he's the master builder. And the foundation, 1 Corinthians 3, is Jesus Christ. And he's building a place for us. Now, I look at the purpose here in verse number 3. That where I am, there you may be also. He would have told us if he didn't have to go, but he had to go so he could get things ready for us. Aren't you glad Jesus Christ is going to be there to greet us? I know our loved ones will be caught up together with them. I know there will be a reunion and we'll get to see them. But Jesus is going to be there. That's the main thing. Man, this, this Savior that we've been preaching about for all these years, this Savior that we've all trusted with our souls, this Savior that we read His Bible, we talk of His works, we talk of His miracles, we, we, we study about Him, we sing about Him. I can't wait to sing again and not be spitting on everybody. Thank God for our Savior. We're going to see Him. He said, I'm going there and I'm going to bring you where I am. Curtis Hudson was an old-time preacher. He's been dead for several years now. And he um, told a story when he pastored in Atlanta. He had a family there that they had three children. And one of their ch children died. They were all under 10. One of them died. And then a few months later, another one died of an unrelated illness. A few more months went by. Less than a year, all three of those children died. Just... A freak thing. And at the funeral of the last child, the mother came to him in tears. She says, why, why did the Lord take every child I have? Well, some families never lose one, you know. And he couldn't explain it. 
He remembered the words of a hymn he quoted to her. My father's way may twist and turn. My heart may throb and ache. But in my soul, I'm glad to know he maketh no mistake. The judgments of the Lord are right. God is a God of love, and God is good, and He never makes a mistake. You might not understand it, but we are not here to understand. In this age of information, we think we got it figured out. We think we've got to fill our heads with all this stuff. God says, I'm going to tell you what you need to know. Isn't that not what they call in the military, some of you? They have different levels, and probably even in law enforcement and things, there's a need-to-know status. In other words, certain things, these, these, these guys sweeping the floor, they don't need to know the secrets that are going on behind closed doors. There's a need-to-know. There's certain things you don't even need to know. God may not allow you to know those things because he's holding those things back for you. If you knew them, you, your mind just might not be able to handle it. You know, the Bible says his ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts higher than our thoughts. You are not like God, and I am not like God. Our minds are infinite. He, our minds are finite, rather. His, his mind is infinite. He makes no mistakes. Our job is not to understand. Our job is to trust, to believe in God. That's what he says. Don't be troubled. Oftentimes in tragedy, I hear it so many times when I talk to people and even in my own self, you, you ask why and you want to get down to the bottom of it. But at the end of that quest, it doesn't change anything. Place, the preparation, the purpose that where I am, there you may be also. You know, heaven wouldn't be heaven without Jesus. And, and if you notice the modern Christian songs, I don't really listen to a whole lot of them. But even some of the ones that trickle down and I, I hear, a lot of times they've gotten more and more egocentric. They've gotten more and more focused on man instead of God. That's the big difference. You read the hymns and it's all about worshiping God. Some of the hymns are even... Pray, prayers and stuff talking about God. A lot of the modern songs are about, you know, me and you, we're going to stroll over heaven together, and I'm going to see my grandmama again, and, and it's all about seeing people. And I know we're going to have a reunion. Don't I, I can preach that. I believe that. I find consolation in that. Paul said, comfort one another with these words. Yes, we should, but we're going to see Jesus Christ. Heaven is about Jesus New Jerusalem is about Jesus Christ who is the light of that city. We won't need any LED lights. We won't need, you know, all this kind of uh, electronics and all this stuff. We won't even need the sun. We will have Jesus Christ. He's the focus. And we get so off track with our information. He says, I've told you what you need to know. You, here's what you need to know. You need to know that you're a sinner... You need to know that Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, that your sins are forgiven, and you're going to heaven. Amen. And you also need to know that you're in fellowship with Him. And if you're walking with Him, and you're keeping things right between you and Him, and you're able to be a good witness to other people, and you're uh, aware that the devil and the world's trying to get you, that's all you need to know. Just get in the Bible and get closer to Jesus Christ and forget about all the stuff. Don't let it drag you down. Don't let it stir you up. Don't let it trouble the waters that God wants to be still and peaceful. God wants us to be able to walk around and have the joy, joy, joy down in our hearts. We ought to have peace. I mean, all the world, they're all in a frenzy, you know. Well, what's going to happen? What if I lose all my retirement? So what? What if you go home and your house burned down because you left the roast on too long or the preacher preached too long? I ain't paying for your house to be rebuilt. <laughs> the first service we had here it was just a quick, quick service and we did I guess it was Mother's Day the first service we had back. I can't remember but anyway she was able to put on a roast and because we just came real quick went, it was, it, everything was just perfect man you could cut it with a fork just. now if it would have been one of our regular services it probably would have been uh, you know like a piece of charcoal Years ago in England, there was a young boy, and back in the day when they sold newspapers on the street and all that kind of stuff, 
And uh, he was always seen out in front of the street. And where he would normally stand, there was a toy store. And he'd always, his routine was, he'd always go by and look through the glass. You know how window shopping used to be a big thing. He'd look through the glass at the toy soldiers. That was part of his routine. Little poor boy. He had to go to work. He quit school because his father had died. And he's just one of these poor street boys selling newspapers. Well, several weeks went by where he was missing. And the uh, shop owner got so used to seeing him, you know, he went out and he was out sweeping his, his, uh, his walk breezeway there and he was asking people about what happened to the little boy you saw always sell the newspapers out here. They said, didn't you hear he got hit? He got run over by one of these trolley cars. He's up over here in the hospital. He's been unconscious for days. So the shopkeeper, he got to thinking and he gathered up all them old toys, that little boy, toy soldiers that little boy used to look at in the window. And he took them up there to the hospital and the boy was still unconscious and he put them all around the bed and he left. He talked to his mom and all and he left. And then when the boy woke up, he saw all those toy soldiers and he got all excited and he said, look mom, there's no glass in between. <laughs> and he grabbed those soldiers, started playing with them. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says now we see through a glass darkly. Everything we do, we do by faith. I've never seen Jesus Christ. I've never seen heaven. I can't tell you with scientific, empirical proof as far as, okay, here's a, uh, uh, you can see it. Here's Jesus Christ. I can't tell you that. I'm looking through a glass darkly. You say, what's that? That's out there. It's dark. I'm living by faith. Never seen him. But I do believe, and here's the last one. You see where I'm going with this. He would have told us if he wasn't coming back. He says in verse number 3, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That's a good sign to make. You know, we have that uh, perhaps today sign. This would be a good one. Somebody was telling me of another one. Uh, they were just saying uh, one day closer. That would be a good one. Every day we're one day closer. You might drop dead today, but that's, you're one day closer. The rapture may happen today. We're one day closer. That's a good positive sign, right? One day closer. But here's, here's one. I will come again. Quote, unquote, Jesus. That's what he said. He would have told us if this is all there was to life. He would have told us if we should just go through life and try to just build up this life and maybe re you know, convert the world through our politics and, and try to be happy and try to just you know, have a bunch of kids and, and build a kingdom down here on earth and try to find some noble cause, maybe find a fish to save or some extinct species to save or, or leave all our money to museums. He would have told us if this is all there was to life. But he said, I'm coming back. He would have told us if we're stuck down here. I'm glad I ain't stuck down here. I'm glad the deepest, darkest, troubled waters that you may find yourself in, and we may get into a situation where we lose all the comforts of this life. We may get into a situation where we lose our health, we lose our wealth, we lose our prosperity, we may even lose our fellowship. We don't know what we may lose down here, but we're still going to gain everything up there. He, told, he would have told us if he wasn't coming back. I like Bible prophecy, and I try to preach on it from time to time. I did a whole, whatever it was, hour and 40 minutes that day, whatever. I don't know, it was about an hour. But, you know, and there was this preacher one time, he was preaching a series on Bible prophecy, all these prophetic messages. And he met one of his parishioners in the store, and she says, Preacher, Pastor, I've really been enjoying those pathetic messages you've been preaching lately. <laughs> <laughs> prophetic, not pathetic. <laughs> You like my pathetic messages? <laughs> I'll preach you another one, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, another pathetic message coming right your way. You know, uh, sometimes these, uh, especially in basketball, I, I do like, if you get a good college basketball game, that's, that's, that's a good thing to watch. I like some of that. Especially because it can get down to the, the final seconds in those games. And uh, there was one particular championship game, I think it was LSU, years ago. And they said what cost them the game in the final minutes was they, got, they were trying to hold on to their lead. They got so obsessed with the clock. They're just watching the clock, watching the clock, watching the clock, watching the clock. We have to be careful that we're not so obsessed watching the clock that we're not watching, waiting, and worshiping Jesus Christ.
He's coming back. I'm going to leave when he's going to come to him. Well, don't you know so-and-so is the Antichrist? I just know that Jesus Christ is coming back, and I, I know the last part of the book. I don't have it all figured out. I just know he said he's coming again. And that's one thing we know. And look, I, I can break it down with the best of them. I like to try to cross all my T's, dot all my I's. But when you study church history, one thing you find is a constant with Bible believers all throughout church history. They didn't always have the details with the pre-tribulation rapture and all those things worked out. But they were always aware and looking for Jesus to return. That's one thing they knew. And one thing I know, he's coming back. Now, I do believe it's pre-tribulation rapture, so don't get me on that. He promised he would come back. In Acts chapter number 1, those disciples are standing out there, and the two men are standing there, maybe Moses and Elijah, maybe just two angels. But they're standing there, and they're looking up, and Jesus Christ just ascends into heaven. And it's not like a rapture. Some people call it a rapture, but it's not like something real fast, and he's already got his glorified body. It's just kind of like he floats on up into heaven. I don't know if it, it seems like it's kind of a slow thing. I don't know. But they're standing there and they're like, and the men are, the men are standing around. They're like, what are you doing? You're going to get a fly in your mouth. Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? You know, kind of like you've studied the, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist. If you ever studied the, the Jehovah's Witness, Seventh-day Adventist, Millerites, you study those groups, and they all got hung up back in the day when Obviously, a lot of the uh, teaching on the second coming was getting real popular back with the fundamentalist movement and different things when people really began to take the Bible literally after they came out of that modernistic movement. But you had people that got wacky, you know, and they'd go on top of a hill and wait for him, you know. Like, we sold all our stuff, they put on a white gown, and they're out there waiting for him, you know. Cuckoo, cuckoo. You know, uh, yeah, you go out and go to spend all the money, run your credit cards up, you know, next week because you think he's coming, you know. Well, you're going to have to pay it if he don't come. Well, I thought Jesus was coming. You know, you send your bill back. You know, send this, uh, the, send the, send, forward this bill to New Jerusalem. <laughs> no, don't be doing that. You need to. Anyway, I forget where I was going with this. Yeah, yeah, he's coming. They're standing there. They're like gazing up into heaven. He told you to go into all the world and preach the gospel. He told us where we're going. We know we're going there. We know he's coming back. But in the meantime, we're not supposed to just sit on top of a hill. We need to tell other people about him. Hey, he is the Savior. He's the one that can forgive you of your sins. He's the one that can give you a place in heaven. He's the one that can save you from hell. He's the one that can give you peace of heart and peace of mind. Let not your heart be troubled. He promised he was coming back. They said, why gaze ye up into heaven? This same Jesus was taken up from you into heaven. Shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. He promised that he was coming back. That's good enough for me. Queen Victoria, after she heard one of her chaplains preaching at Windsor on the second coming of Christ, she said, I wish that he would come in my lifetime. They said, why do you want him to come in your lifetime? She said, I would like to take my crown and place it at his feet. And that's something. Well, I'm done. The Lord told us what we, need to do, what we need to know. We need to work for Him while we're here, do something for Christ. We need to worship Him while we're here, and we need to wait for Him. He said, let not your heart be troubled. He would have told us. So don't get all out of sorts in this information age, because you're trying to get the update on this, and trying to get to the bottom of this, and... I mean, this is a hard one for some of you to swallow. But there's some things, there's a lot of things you just simply are going to have a clue on. And we are to live by faith, and he has given you what you need. Let's just let it be simple. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. Love God, serve God, he's coming back. Don't worry about it going to be all right. Let's have a word of prayer. Let's bow with our heads closed, heads bowed and eyes closed. We'll ask Sister Sherry to play us an invitational hymn. Just a few